This talk is going to be about the, uh, the famous Barmer Choke study. This one's been going on for about five years. It's been a big study. Um, in fact, it's had other incarnations before this, uh, this formal study. Um, the first speaker we've got, it's going to be a tandem presentation for this one uh, to reflect the size of this project. Uh, the uh, first speaker is going to be Erin uh, Murphy from Sinclair Knight Merch. It's a, a, a river modeler. And then uh, Sarah Commons from Murray Darling Basin Authority, freshwater ecologist working with uh, the Living Murray Initiative and um, water resources. All right, please welcome Erin. Hi, so this project's going to take us on a slightly different tack, and rather than looking at ecology, we're going to talk about some of the river operations considerations of the Barmachoke itself. So, this is a, an engineer's version of a map in that it's a schematic diagram of the system just pointing out where Barmer is, not that we don't know. And rather than being a particular point on the river, it's about a 40 kilometre stretch formed by the Cadult Fault Uplift. And when you're talking for a modeler or a hydrology modeler, it's considered to have a capacity of 10,600 megs a day measured downstream of Yarrawonga Weir. So there's a bit of conjecture about what the actual capacity is, but when we do hydrology modelling, that's the capacity that we use. So we all know that the choke plays an important role in good flooding of the forest, but it also plays a role in sort of operational constraints. I was told not to use the word constraints, so sorry about that. Um, <laughs> sorry, just ignore I said that. Um, so, it, yeah. <laughs> so it puts a restriction on the volume of water that can be delivered downstream to irrigation demands and also to meet supplies to South Australia during those high summer demand months. Um, it can be a driver, or not a driver, but it can cause rainfall rejections during summer months when the capacity is running pretty high and rainfall occurs and all the irrigation orders get cancelled. Um, it can also pose challenges for the delivery of environmental flows and it places restrictions on water trade from upstream to downstream. So they're the particular issues that this study was concerned with. So the limited capacity of the Barmer Choke has been of interest for a very long time, as people in this room know. And it sort of started with the construction of levees and forest regulators in the 50s and even earlier in the 40s. Uh, the great desnagging project of the 1980s, which was a really great idea at the time, but I think we've all learned a lot since then. Uh, investigation of large scale bypasses started really early on in the 60s and 70s, such as the Bunner Walsh Canal, which still gets bandied about as an option even now. Uh, through to the more modern work that we've been doing. So the Barmer Choke study started in 2007 and was mostly completed last year. And then you've got basin plan modelling and other projects associated with that, which sort of started in 2010. So the Barmer Choke study was completed in what I'd call three main phases. The first phase wanted to know exactly how big those operational issues were. So what we did was we used modelling to assess the magnitude of the problem under current conditions, where current was defined as about January 2010 at the time. And what it found was that shortfalls or rationing of diversions occurred in about 32% of years under current conditions. And they were at least partially constrained by the Barmer Choke. And that each side of the Barmer Mill Forest was wet unseasonally in about 39% of years. So unseasonally was defined as flooding into the forest between January and April. <coughs> Uh, we also often get asked that won't this problem all just go away under climate change or with enhanced environmental watering? So we did investigate this. Uh, to test sensitivity to climate change, we looked at a 2030 dry scenario and we found that it did re result in a reduction in unseasonal flooding, but the number of years for shortfalls actually increased because there's still the large demands downstream and there's still the storage upstream, so it still stays a problem. Uh, we also looked at an enhanced environmental watering scenario and modelling suggests that that won't have much of an impact on unseasonal flooding or shortfalls, but it's very sensitive to where the water is recovered from and how and where it's used, so it's really hard to 
sort of quantify that at this stage. Uh, we did think about doing a combined scenario, but there's so much uncertainty in both of those that combining them together just created even more uncertainty, so we didn't want to go too far down that path. So the next phase of the study used modelling and other assessment techniques to look at the potential of 19 different options to resolve some of the issues associated with bomber choke. Um, don't worry about reading all of those, there's way too many up there. But the options themselves can be broken into sort of four main groups. So there's policy options, so that's using what's already out there slightly differently to get some benefits. There's options that look at using storages upstream of the Barma Choke to manage unseasonal flooding. Options that look at bypass, so that's bypasses that direct water around the Barma Choke, and they can be used for unseasonal flooding or shortfalls. And then there's options that look at storages below Barma Choke to manage shortfalls. So this is a really pretty diagram. Um, so options were assessed in terms of their effectiveness, cost and risk. So risk was assessed using standard risk analysis techniques. Costings were very approximate at this stage, you'd probably call them pre-feasibility costings. And effectiveness was assessed using modelling um, and we used MSM Big Mod for all of these assessments. So this diagram tries to wrap all of those considerations up into one diagram. And when you're looking at it, the size of the dot indicates the cost of the option, so bigger is more expensive. The colour of the dot indicates the risk associated with it, so green is good and red is bad. Well, green is less bad. <laughs> um, and the location of the dot tells you how effective it is. So on the y-axis, we've got its effectiveness for unseasonal flooding. And on the x-axis, you've got the effectiveness for shortfalls. So the do nothing option is up in here, it's in that top corner. And what you'd expect is that an option that's effective for flooding, whoop, sorry, can't find the laser, would bring you along this way. And an option that's effective for shortfalls will bring you along this way. And what you're targeting is an option that brings you down this way Although we all know that unseasonal flooding is a partially natural occurrence, so you're not actually targeting zero, zero, just less than current. And what this diagram shows is that many of the individual options were quite effective for dealing with one or both of the, one of both of the types of problems, but neither of them, or none of them, represented a full solution for both problems. So what we did next was we looked at different packages of options. So we considered four packages, and what they did was combine different sets of options to try and present a sort of more complete solution. So the first package of options considered four, option, four individual options that were low cost, low risk, and could be implemented quickly with minimal infrastructure works. So the options considered here was manipulation of the six inch rule, which is a rule that controls the rate of downdraw below Hume, uh, diverting water around the paracuta escape using its existing capacity, which is 200 megs a day, uh, effect, or altering the pattern of releases from the intervalley trade accounts to target shortfalls, and manipulating the water levels in about four of the lower weirs to try and manage shortfalls as well. The second package of option contained all of the things in option package one, but also two additional options to further manage shortfalls. So it included greater manipulation of Euston and Mildura weirs. Option package three again contained everything in option package one, plus the option of enhancing the escape capacity of the Edward escape. Uh, with an additional 2,000 megs a day bypass capacity. And the final package is option package four, which contained everything in option package one, plus the option to manipulate the water levels in Lake Mulwala to manage unseasonal flooding. And what the assessment found is that the do nothing option is up here. Package one on its own 
has quite a significant effect on shortfalls. It's very effective and has a small impact on unseasonal flooding, but not too much. When you look at package two, you can see that it's not much more effective than option package one. And that's not so much a reflection on the effectiveness of option package two, more a reflection on the fact that most of the problem was solved by option package one, so there wasn't much left for two to do. Um, but after the, both of those, there's still a bit of a problem with unseasonal flooding. So option package three and four were quite effective for those. And that just shows you where we want to go. So option package one and two help with shortfalls, and option package three and four help with unseasonal flooding. So the study concluded that there's merit in continuing and enhancing implementation of option package one. Some of the works in option package one are sort of on the ground now. Some of them there's investigations happening right now. So it's partially in practice today and can be implemented relatively quickly with the existing infrastructure and without significant implications for operating budgets. It's highly effective for shortfalls. So we went from having shortfalls in 36 years over a 114 year modelling period to just four. And the residual shortfalls that were left were much smaller and lasted for a much shorter period. Uh, it is effective for unseasonal flooding with a 10% reduction, uh, but it is still a bit of a problem. Uh, and further works are required to complete the investigation, some of which are happening now, but it's fairly close to being able to be implemented. Uh, the other option packages build on the benefits of package one but require further consideration and investigation of specific issues. So option package two, whilst it has the potential to be effective, uh, would be used infrequently to manage shortfalls and to the extent that's possible with the existing infrastructure it should be considered when necessary. Package three and four have benefits for um, unseasonal flooding but have specific issues that need to be investigated. So package three, which is the use of the Edward Escape additional capacity, is more affected, but it's also more expensive as, and it's um, sensitive to available capacity in the Edward River and where I forest flooding issues. So we don't want to just move the problem. So you've got to use it within the capacity constraints of the Edward River Cool System as well. Package four is the additional manipulation of water levels in Lake Mawela. So that's quite a sensitive issue for social and community considerations. So before any consideration of that option could take place, or any further consideration, uh, the MDBA would need to do further work. So they remain committed <coughs> to the Lake Mawela land and on water management plan, which means that no implementation of this option will take place until all the necessary studies looking at social and community economic implementations, uh, sorry, yeah, implications have been investigated. Um, and it's worth pointing out that there's no immediate plans to implement this option. I think that's all I had to say, so I might pass you on to Sarah now, who's gonna take you through some of the more policy side things. 